What's up, Crave? Pastor Epi here, the director for our School of Ministry and Leadership. And hey, man, they let me come back and they let me share the word of God with you. Praise the Lord. Hopefully what I share today will allow me to come back in the future again. But you know what? I had the distinct honor to introduce a brand new series with you guys, and it's called The Tea. And you know, I actually had to learn this phrase called spill the tea. You know what I'm saying, sis? Bro, too hard. Okay, back in my day, we called it the 411. That's when you had to dial on the phone. But basically it's this. Let me hook you up in case you don't know. The T is like the inside story, like the gossip, like what's the truth? Like what's really going on? And we want to turn it for the positive. And we want to say, hey, God, would you spill the tea and talk about our purpose, our identity? What's the reason why we're here? And so I'm super excited to team up with your Crave pastors to talk about different characters in the Bible because the characters they chose and, and the character they gave me are not perfect at all. These people are just like you and just like me. They struggle with anger. They struggled with lust. They struggled with pride, with unbelief. And the person I'm gonna talk about today struggled a lot with shame. But you know what? Before we get into our Bible study, I wanna do a quick little survey because I wanna talk about the tea that God has for you because he wants to invite you into a larger story than you can ever imagine or believe. Now, l let me ask you this question because a lot of you don't know me yet in which I would love to get to know you guys. But let's just say, one day, I'm in downtown Freeport at Galena Tacos. Hey, awesome food, guys. I'm just saying. And, and anyways, while they're there, th there's the Fast and Furious, and they're on like number 29, I think. I don't know. But the, the producer, he comes up to me, you know, mid-bite, like, hey, what's going on? And he says, hey, Vin Diesel is going to walk through this restaurant right here, and would you be an extra? Would you be that extra person in the background that makes it look more realistic? Yeah, no problem, absolutely. And so I take my place and I get my taco and Vin Diesel is about to come in and they say, action. So Vin Diesel walks through like, hey, we're family or whatever he says. And I'm like, like, like trying to bite it, you know, that is looking as realistic as possible. And the scene lasts maybe about three seconds and the producer says, cut, that's a wrap. Thank you so much. And I'm like, man, I can't believe I get to star in my own movie. Like this is amazing. And so I tell the producer, producer, When's the premiere? Because I would love to invite my family, my friends, my church family. It'll be so awesome. And so he says, July 3rd, we're going to premiere it all across the world. And so I get super hyped, guys. I'm so excited. And, and I tell Crave Network, I tell Crossroads Network, I tell my mama, right? And I say, guys, you got to come see this premiere, this movie that I am starring in. And you know what I do? I, I rent out the local cinema that seats a thousand people. I, I buy the popcorn. I buy the candy. And once again, I'm so excited that I come to my own premiere and I dress up to the nines. Like, man, I am looking so fashionable that I actually look like Pastor Manny. And man, I look so good, except I'm going to keep my facial hair. But I look so good. And so as we come to this premiere, you know, this three hour long movie, I start noticing that my scene is coming up. And as my scene is coming up, I stand up and I say, hey guys, here's my part. You're going to love it. And once again, Vin Diesel walks by and you see me mid true, like kind of like that. And, and I start clapping for myself. And you guys are all utterly confused by now. And then I yell out, I will be signing autographs, $10 a pop in the foyer. Let me know. So here's that survey question for you. If you witnessed that, and if you saw that, what would you think of me? Like, let's be real. You'd be like, man, that guy's full of himself. That guy is weird. That guy is narcissistic. Or maybe that guy's on something, right? Like anything you might be thinking about me would not be positive. In fact, it would be negative towards me. So let me ask you this question. If your life or even this word of God here, or metaphorically a movie, who would you say is the main character in your life? Think about it for a second. Are you acting how I did in that example? Because the Bible tells us that our life is just a vapor, that our life is here today and it's gone tomorrow. And yet what do we focus more on ourselves? 
Hey guys, I get the attention. Hey guys, look at me. Hey guys, and your scene is done. So once again, if you're still struggling right now to answer who the main character to life and to this word of God is, let me do another questionnaire for you. And Crave Nation, I know you can join me. And in case you're not part of Crave Nation, I need you to answer as well. I'm a holla back preacher, guys. I need to hear you. Here we go. Ready? Question number one. Were you there when God created the heavens and the earth? Go for it. One person. Great job. Yeah. No. Were you there when Adam and Eve fell? No. Better. Okay. Were you there when God established a covenant with Abraham? No. Were you there to free the Israelites from Egypt? No. Were you there to split the Red Sea so the Israelites can go? No. Were you there to allow the Israelites to go into the promised land? No. Were you there when Jesus was born? No. Were you there? I'm getting hyped up now. Wait, were you there when Jesus was crucified? No. Were you there when Jesus rose again? No. Were you there when Jesus ascended again and said, I am coming back? No. So the thing is, guys, the main character to our life, to all human history, to this very word of God, is God himself. And God is not a stingy God, but he says, in fact, this, and let me spill some tea here already, is that God invites you and he invites me to join a story that began and existed long before you were born. But you know what? The character that we're going to go study over today, Rahab. There might be different things and different excuses that may keep us from entering into this larger story. Once again, it might be a sin. It might be unbelief. And it might be shame. It might be because of what you experienced in the past. Those past mistakes that haunt you. That chide you. And once again, here's the biggest thing that you need to know. Shame and conviction are different. Conviction is what the Holy Spirit does to us. He convicts us of a need of a savior. He convicts us of where we are wrong. And this conviction draws me closer to God or as shame. The enemy uses shame. And the enemy says, not not only did you do wrong, but you in fact are wrong. And by us taking this false identity, living in this false movie or this narrative of life, guys, we take on an identity that does not belong to us. Because God once again says, no, take that off and come follow me. Come and join me. So as you open up to Joshua chapter two, or as you fire up your devices, here's some context. Long story short, the Israelites are in bondage. And so God sends Moses, let my people go. He let them go after a while. Split the Red Sea, they're walking, boom. And they come to the precipice of the promised land. And so what Moses does, he gets 12 spies to go spy out this land that God said it is their land. And so these spies go and they say, man, it's a land filling with milk and honey. It's amazing. It's great. But you know what? There's giants and there's fortified cities and, oh man, we're going to die. And as the Israelites, (laughs) they heard this, they're like, oh man, like, why did God bring us here to die? Like, let's just go back to Egypt and be slaves once again. Oh God. So God's like, I, you know what? New Epi translation. I, you know what? You guys are going to wander around, and you guys will not enter into the promised land. So 40 years go by. Moses is dead, and now Joshua is taking over, and and God says, oh, you guys are about to take the promised land. And you know what? Be strong and courageous, for I am with you. And he says this three times by the time we get to this story. And so Joshua doesn't get 12 spies. He just gets two now because he doesn't want that debacle to happen again. And so these two, decide, two spies, they, they go into Jericho. As they enter into Jericho, as, as it says in verse 1, and Joshua, the son of Nun, sent two men secretly from Shittim as spies, saying, go view the land, especially Jericho. And they went and came into the house of a prostitute whose name was Rahab and lodged there. Now, guys, I got to tell you some behind the scene. Let me spill some tea on myself, how I study this word. When I read narratives, I try to engage in the story, and I try to be in the sandals of certain characters. 
And I got to tell you, as I've been studying and preparing for the story of Rahab, I've had a couple of issues. I cannot relate. Here's three in particular. Number one, I'm not a woman. Obvi, right? I have no clue how it feels to to think like one, to, to be one. I have no clue. Number two, in ancient days, women were treated different as they are in America right now. Back in that time, in the ancient culture, women were known as property. So many times, women weren't even named or numbered or anything. They couldn't own land. They couldn't do anything because they were just a woman. Number three, she was a prostitute. Guys, I have no experience of what it feels like to be a prostitute. So once again, I'm trying to engage. I'm trying to be empathetic. I'm trying to understand, trying to get into her mindset. And you know what I, what I thought about, guys, is this. Here she was, and I question, when did she enter into this profession? Was it when she was a little girl? The Bible is silent on when it happened. Did her dad say, hey, that's all you'll be good for? Or or were they bankrupt and poor? And she says, this is the only way that I can provide for my family. And so she's so successful that she is able to own a house where her family lives. And not only that, once again, the mindset, because I've heard so many different stories of human trafficking and women who have been out of this life and men as well, to know that your body, all it's good for is for someone's gratification. For someone to use you, to mistreat you, not care about your safety, not care about your heart, not care about your mind, not care about you, the person. They just care about your body. And once again, in those studies of of women who have been raped or in human trafficking, how they cope, as, as Rahab might have had a customer, she disassociates herself from her mind. Like, let me just escape for as long as this lasts. Like, that's the only way I can cope because he is using me. And you know what? I'm getting money for this. Like, gosh, like the, the shame. Like, once again, if you were in Rahab's shoes, what would you think if you looked in the mirror? This is all I'm good for? This is all that there is to life? Like, this is the story that I'm a part of? This is my movie? Like, this is it? Like, once again, is she just gonna do this for a certain season of life or five more years, I'll save up enough? Or is she stuck in this for the rest of her life? What hope is there? What success is there? What what legacy will she leave behind? So we pick up our story. The spies come, and they come into the house of Rahab. And I got to skip a couple verses, and we'll return to them. But for the sake of this study, I want to show you guys verse 8. Here we go. So she takes the spies, and she notes that they're spies because being a Canaanite woman, knowing the community, knowing the men that come into her house and all that, there's something completely different about these Israelites. And so she hides them. And this is what she says. She says this, Before the men lay down, she came up to them on the roof, and she said to the men, I know that the Lord has given you the land and that the fear of you has fallen upon us. Circle that, highlight that mental note on us. And that all the inhabitants of the land melt away before you. For we, circle, underline, highlight, we'll go back to that. For we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea before you when you came out of Egypt and what you did to the two kings of the Amorites who were beyond the Jordan, to Sihon and Og, whom you devoted to destruction. And here's a key verse, guys, verse 11. Hey, I need you to pay attention. Ray, check this out. Verse 11. And as soon as we heard it, our hearts melted, and there was no spirit left in any man because of you, for the Lord your God, He is God in the heavens above and on the earth beneath. Here's why I wanted to visit these verses first. Because there's some time within the past 40 years that the story went all the way from Sinai in the wilderness all the way to Jericho. 
Their reputation superseded them that maybe Rahab, I don't know how old she was at this time, she heard about it and it melted her heart. This could have been 10 years. This could have been 20 years. This could have been 39 years. I don't know. But day in and day out, she had this in her mind and she had this in her heart saying, oh my gosh, there is a God that is so alive. There is a God that takes care of his people because Rahab lived in Jericho, a Canaanite culture that worshiped so many different deities and different gods that only wanted something from people and never gave protection, never gave purpose, never gave life. And can you imagine once again, disassociating with Rahab's mind? This is all I'm good for. There's no larger story. What about Yahweh? What about the God of the Israelites? Surely he is God of the heavens and the earth beneath. Like, and I, and I kind of wanted, this is where it sparked when she heard it. I wonder if there's hope that I can join them. I wonder if there's hope that I can be a part of that story. I wonder if there's hope that can break me from this bondage. I wonder if there's hope that can take me away from this life. I wonder if there's hope that can rescue me. I want a God just like that. So as Rahab saw these spies for the first time, Rahab, and here's our point right here, she embarked on one of the longest journeys anyone can ever make. And that is a journey of 18 inches from the head to the heart. It's the longest journey because so many of us know what we should do. We know what is right, but it never makes it to the heart where we say, I'm going to live it and I'm going to do it. You see what Rahab did when she saw the spies, she embarked on that journey. And I don't know if you noticed this, guys. Rahab was still a prostitute at the time. She wasn't cleaned up. She, she didn't know all Torah. She didn't already do and say everything to the Israelites. She was still a hot mess, guys. But she still embarked on the journey just as she was saying, I have hope and I want to go and I want to be with that God and his people. This is what she did. As it, the, the spies were there, the king heard that there were spies coming to her house. And so he sent different guards, armed guards, and they said, Rahab, where are they? We heard that they're here. And she lied. The consequence for lying to these armed guards was her very life. And not only her life, her business, her success, her house, her family, her friends, everyone that is with her, dead. And she says, it is worth it. That journey of 18 inches had caused her to act in righteousness to hide the people of God. In the book of James, it attributes what she did as righteous. What she did, guys, in the book of Hebrews in chapter 11 is known as the Hall of Faith. And that's where you have Moses and Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all these people. But you'll notice that Joshua is not mentioned, but Rahab is. Why is she in the Hall of Faith? Because she started that journey of 18 inches. Can I tell you the other repercussions of her journey? Guys, open up to Joshua chapter 6. I'll race you. Ha, huh, I beat you. It's probably on the screen now. Okay, Joshua chapter six, verse 22. So this is what happens. The spies go back to Joshua and they say, hey, the Lord said it's ours. Let's go. And so they, they march around Jericho. It's an awesome story. Read it, guys. And so the Israelites are coming to plunder the land and, and take over. But the spies made an agreement with Rahab that they will protect her and her family so that she can be a part of this community, so she can join this God that's so active and alive. And so you read in verse 22, but the two men who had spied out the land, Joshua said, go into the prostitute's house and bring out from there the woman and all who belong to her as you swore to her. So the young men who had been spies went in and brought out Rahab and her father and her mother and her brothers and all who belong to her. And they brought all her relatives and put them outside the camp of Israel. And they burned the city with fire and everything in it, only the silver and the gold and the vessels of bronze and of iron, they put into the treasury of the house of the Lord. But Rahab, the prostitute, and her father's 
household and all who belonged to her, Joshua saved alive. And she has lived in Israel to this day because she hid the messengers whom Joshua spent to spy out Jericho. The journey that she chose to take not only affected her life, but it affected her family. It affected her friends. It affected everybody in her household, her her sphere of influence. And as you read on in Matthew chapter one, it goes over the genealogy of Jesus. And you know what her journey of 18 inches, you know who else it affected? Her great, great grandson. You know who that is? King David. Her journey of 18 inches affected her great, 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 grandson. You know who that is? Jesus Christ. Let's spill some tea here real quick. The life that God has for you guys is to be part of a larger story of a kingdom that is alive, a kingdom that is thriving, a kingdom where God reigns. And your journey, guys, doesn't only affect your life and the time here on earth, but it affects your future lineage. It affects your future grandchildren and your great, great grandchildren. And you think, you see guys, just look at this. Your life and your kingdom, if you're living in your own story, your own movie, it will fade and it will pass away and not be remembered. But you can be part of this kingdom, this larger story and your future lineage as well if you take that step of 18 inches, just like Rahab. But there's so many excuses of why, why I can't do it. Like, I I just can't, God. Once again, it could be a sin. It could be my past. It could be my unbelief. It could be so many different things. And let me end with this note here. Because you see, God knows you intimately and he loves you tremendously. That he takes away all excuses that you might have that will keep you from entering into his larger story. I love what John Corson said. He said this, that Jesus bled from seven different places. And we see in Leviticus chapter 17, verse 11, that the blood of Christ, the, the, there's life in the blood. And so you remember in Isaiah when it prof- prophesied that Jesus, his beard would be pulled out of his chin, allowing that blood to flow onto his face. Why? for every single time that you and I have said something that we should have never said. How many of you have ever said, I hate you? Go to hell. I don't love you. And we use this mouth not to the glory of God, but to the glory of our own story. He bled there for you. They took this crown of thorns. Guys, these thorns were long and large and they pierced his brain and they pierced his skull and and the blood flowed down to his eyes. Why? For every single thought that you shouldn't have thought. How many of you have ever hated or lusted or thought something so horrible that you, if you put those thoughts out so everyone else can see, you'd be so embarrassed. You'd be so ashamed And the blood flowed to his eyes. Why? For every single thing that you and I should have never looked at. Whether it be sin, whether it be pornography, whether it be a different way, whatever it may be, the blood of Christ flowed for you. And they took Jesus to go be whipped like just any other convict. And they designed this whip for convicts to confess their crimes. And and this whip was special. It wasn't like a chancla. It wasn't just like a belt. Guys, this whip had so many different lashes. And on the end of these lashes was bone, rock, or glass. And as they would whip the convict, this whip would go into the skin and be torn out, exposing raw flesh. They whipped Jesus 40 times. And the reason why is because he had nothing to confess. He was purely innocent. So the blood flowed from his back. Why? For every single time that you and I turned our backs on him. They put the cross on his shoulders. And as you could feel the wood on his exposed flesh, walking up to Golgotha to be crucified, they laid him down and they put his arms outstretched. And they put the nails into his wrists, feeling excruciating pain. And the blood flowed on his hands. Why? For every single time we touched things that we shouldn't have touched. 
Once again, we not use our hands to the glory of God, but we raised it in anger or we used it towards sin. They got his feet and they got another nail and they nailed his feet to the cross where the blood flowed down to his feet. Why? Because every single time that you and I walked away from God, my sin is more attractive. My coping mechanism is more helpful. God, I know you tell me this, but I just got to keep walking toward this way of life. But the thing is, guys, as I'm sharing this with you, and you might be thinking, that, that, that's interesting. I, I never heard that. But, Epi, you don't know me. You don't know what I've been through. You don't know what this anger that I have in me. You don't know this, this past that I've dealt with. You don't know the, the abuse that I've experienced, the molestation. You don't, you don't know me. And God, let alone my future spouse, would never want someone just like me. Because if you saw what's inside, you would run away. I have good news for you. Because Jesus bled there too. As I took the spear and they pierced his side, allowing the blood to come out. The blood of Christ covers us from head to toe, from the inside out. And let me spill some tea here. That God didn't do that. He didn't send you his son so that you can have a Sunday morning experience. So that you can have a weekly experience with him. But he did that so you can have the abundant life that you can live in a larger story or a larger movie as we explained earlier with no excuses. He says, come to me. I want to take you out of darkness and bring you into my marvelous light. I want to help you go on this journey of 18 inches. I want to empower you. I want to be with you. I forgive you. I love you. And your past, it doesn't matter. I'm going to redeem. I'm going to reconcile. I'm going to do amazing things through you. No more excuses. Brother, sister, sister, Will you join me in prayer? And would you begin that step on that journey of 18 inches? No more excuses, amen? Father, I thank you so much for this time that we can study Rahab. And I thank you so much, God, that you use her despite her past. You use her simple act of obedience and righteousness, Lord, that has affected human history, that we can read about her today. And so, Father, I ask you that there's any brother or sister here that is struggling with their past or their past is holding on to them. Father, I pray through your Holy Spirit that you will break it, God, and that you will open their eyes, Father, to allow them to see a greater vision and a greater kingdom and a greater story that they are invited into today. So, Lord, I ask you that you bless those that hear this, Lord, that through you they are made new, and through you, Lord, they are made as more than conquerors. They are not known as their past, Lord, but they are known as a child of God. Thank you so much, God. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, if you prayed that prayer with our pastor tonight, we want to know about it. Would you let us know in the comments below by typing in, I prayed, uh, and we want to resource you as you begin your new walk in Christ. As always, Crave, thank you for being here. We love you. We're for you. And we're praying that you have a fantastic week.